It's human nature to prescribe meaning to scary coincidences. Normally, coincidences are just that, coincidences. There's no connection between the two events, or at least not a connection that we can determine with our current understanding of science. But they remain scary and can have more of an impact than the two events would otherwise have. Number 5 On June 20th, 1941, Soviet scientists opened the tomb of an ancient ruler. Inscribed on the tomb was the warning of a curse. Whomsoever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader more terrible than I. Two days later, Germany invaded the Soviet Union without warning. Some blame the curse of Tamerlane for the German invasion. In reality, Germany had been preparing for months and had actually pushed back the invasion date. The timing was just a coincidence, but definitely a disturbing one. Tamerlane was a fearsome ruler who created an empire to rival that of Genghis Khan. He was named Timur at birth and earned the title The Lame after being struck by two arrows when he was young. He walked with a distinct limp. One leg was shorter than the other and he was missing two fingers. That didn't stop him from rising to power during the 1360s. He became a formidable military leader and was in the right place to take advantage of a change in power structures in the Chagatai Khanate. The Chagatai Khanate was just part of the empire that Genghis Khan had ruled over. When the great Khan had passed, his empire was split between his sons and grandsons. The Chagatai Khanate was ruled by the descendants of Genghis Khan's son, Chagatai. By the 1360s, other parts of the empire were ruled by the descendants of other sons and China had been taken over by the Ming Dynasty. In the space of just 40 years, much of that would change. Tamerlane led armies throughout Asia, spreading both east and west as Genghis Khan had done 250 years earlier. At its maximum, the empire spread from modern-day Turkey to Kyrgyzstan and south to parts of India. Also like Genghis Khan, Tamerlane's impact on the local population was devastating. His reputation as a fearsome ruler was well earned, and huge portions of the local populations did not live long enough to be part of the new Timurid Empire. Tamerlane himself wasn't a descendant of Genghis Khan, but the great Khan's great-grandfather's brother. That meant that he wasn't eligible to rule under Mongolian tradition, so he installed a puppet ruler while he took the title of Amir. In reality, it was clear who was in charge, and the Timur dynasty was born. Tamerlane's empire would never stretch as far as the Great Khans, though. It was China that would be Tamerlane's undoing. In December of 1404, he launched a campaign against the Ming rulers. Tamerlane preferred to fight in the spring when conditions would be better for the Mongol warriors. But for unknown reasons, he chose to launch a winter campaign. It would be one of the coldest winters the area had seen in recent times. In early 1405, Tamerlane fell ill. Around February 18th, he passed away. His body was brought back and placed in a grand mausoleum that would go on to become a family tomb. Over the centuries, the fact that this was the final resting place of one of the most influential people in history was forgotten. That is, until 1942. Why Tamerlane's tomb was uncovered is uncertain. By the 1930s, identifying the locations of the final resting places of great historical figures was seen as an important task for scholars across Europe. The discoveries of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt had been happening for decades, but there was more to be discovered in Europe and Asia. As part of that, learning the location of Tamerlane could have been seen as an important mission for Soviet archaeologists. Alternatively, it may have been discovered by accident while digging for gold or due to an accident during the construction of a nearby hotel. Archaeologists first discovered a marble sarcophagus containing the remains of two sons of Tamerlane. When the remains of Tamerlane's grandson were also found, it was clear that this was a family tomb, and archaeologists were hopeful that they'd found the correct location. This was a major excavation. As well as scientists and anthropologists, there were writers and filmmakers ready to capture the moment that the warlord was discovered. According to legend, the goal of the excavation spread around the local community, and it was met with resistance. The legend seems to have started with Malik Kayamal, who was one of the people present during the excavation. 
inscribed on the outside of the tomb were the words, when I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. It's not clear how much the locals knew about the war in Europe. It hadn't yet come to the Soviet Union. But they were not looking for any reason to upset whoever had written the inscription. According to Kayamov, three elderly men came to the group and begged the scientist not to open the tomb. But their pleas fell on deaf ears. First, the jade tombstone was removed. That also came with its own legend. The tombstone was split and according to the legend, it had once been used by a Persian commander for the footing of his throne. As soon as it was in place, earthquakes shook his land and he suffered a serious illness. He connected the misfortune to the stone and returned it to the tomb. During transportation, it fell and split. Removing the tombstone also proved to be tricky for the scientists. According to one story, the hoisting gear used to remove the stone stopped working. It was eventually removed and attention turned to the tomb that the stone was for. Beneath six slabs of stone was a marble sarcophagus with a well-preserved wooden coffin inside. On June 20th, the coffin was revealed to contain the remains of Timur the Lame. It was immediately clear this was the person they had come for. From the two missing fingers to the fact that his right kneecap had grown into the lower thigh, it was clear that this skeleton matched the descriptions of the famous Tamerlane. Ignoring the warnings, the remains were removed from the tomb and taken to Moscow. Operation Barbarossa was put into effect two days later. This seemingly fulfilled the promises of both inscriptions. Planning for the German invasion had begun in 1940. The original date for the operation to begin was May 15th. This was pushed back for reasons that are still debated to this day. The fact the delay meant that it coincided with the opening of this ancient tomb was merely a coincidence. But when Joseph Stalin heard of the curse, he didn't think the invasion was simply a coincidence. In November of 1942, the remains of Tamerlane and his family were returned and reburied according to Islamic traditions. It was shortly after this that the tide turned in the Battle of Stalingrad. This too was another coincidence. The battle would continue until February and it was a long time before the war itself would be over. Number 4 Wolfgang Pauli was one of the brightest theoretical physicists at a time when the giants of theoretical physics were debating the topic of general relativity. His life was also plagued by a series of coincidences that left his co-workers believing he was cursed. It ended with one of the strangest coincidences of all. Pauli was born in 1900 to a chemist also named Wolfgang and was the godson of physicist Ernst Mach. From a young age, it was clear that he was going to be a prodigy in his field. He received a PhD at just 21 years of age, focusing on the subject of quantum theory for his thesis. He attracted the praise of Albert Einstein himself after writing a 237-page encyclopedia article on the subject of the theory of relativity. Before long, he was working with some of the greatest scientists of the age on unraveling the mysteries of the atom. Pauli was a man who didn't like things that didn't have a reason. It wasn't good enough to figure out what something was or how something worked, but he wanted to know why things worked. He also wasn't afraid to critique the work of others. He coined the phrase, not even wrong, which he used to refer to arguments that worked on a faulty premise or otherwise it couldn't be debated scientifically. So when he came up with a principle that explained an important issue in science, but couldn't explain why it worked, it was troubling to him. He coined the principle, the exclusion principle, but others referred to it as the Pauli principle. It explained why electrons in an atom are the way they are, by creating a new quantum number that was later referred to as spin. Electrons now had four quantum numbers and no electrons with the same four quantum numbers could occupy the same state. The Pauli principle would make Pauli famous in physics, as well as his description of the neutrino decades before it was proven to exist. But just as widely acknowledged as the Pauli principle was the Pauli effect. Scientists, especially physicists, usually fall into one of two categories, theoretical or experimental. Both are important in advancing our knowledge of how the world works, but it's rare that someone is good at both. Pauli was a theoretical physicist. He used math to come up with his theories and left the physical proof and experiments to other people. 
This was an arrangement any experimental physicist was happy with because whenever Pauli was around, experiments went wrong. One of the most famous examples of this took place on February 22nd, 1950 at Princeton University. Since 1936, the university had been home to a cyclotron used to accelerate particles to high speeds. That afternoon, the oil in the machinery suddenly caught a light, almost completely destroying the machine. No cause for the fire could be found, but it ruined the $400,000 machine. Pauli was, of course, visiting the university at the time. His friends mostly experienced the Pauli effect in their laboratories. Machines would suddenly break for no reason, only to start working again a few hours later, once Pauli had been removed from the area. Other times, experiments failed despite having worked in the past. Glassware broke and things caught fire, but somehow Pauli himself always emerged unscathed. It wasn't limited to the laboratory, though. There were many stories of cars breaking down and one anecdote about an expensive Chinese vase sliding off of a table without any obvious cause. Even Pauli's closest friends and co-workers banned him from their laboratories to try to stop the curse. Often when things did go wrong, the first thing to ask was where Pauli was. On one occasion, an expensive piece of measuring equipment stopped working for no reason. A few hours later, it started again without anything having been done to it. This time, Pauli was nowhere to be found. He was actually away visiting another scientist in Zurich at the time. One of the scientists at the Göttingen wrote to Pauli, commenting about how he was definitely innocent this time. Pauli responded that on the day of the incident, he'd been traveling to Zurich by train. At the exact time, he'd been waiting at the Göttingen station, having to have switched trains. Pauli believed in the Pauli effect himself. He would apparently feel an inner tension before the effect took place and then relief afterward. A man who wanted to understand the why in everything would seem like the last person to believe in a curse, but Pauli believed in parapsychology. He worked with the psychologist Carl Jung on the concept of synchronicity, which gave meaning to coincidences. Pauli's life would also end with a strange coincidence. In his later years, there was a new problem that he was struggling with. In 1916, a new fundamental constant was discovered by Arnold Summerfield. It could be used to measure a number of things involving atomic particles, in a similar way that pi can be used to measure a number of things involving circles. The constant earned the name the Summerfield constant. When 1 was divided by this number, it came to roughly 137. Pauli was one of a few scientists who believed that there was significance to the number 137. In 1958, Pauli was taken to a hospital for treatment for pancreatic cancer. He was visited by his assistant and was extremely stressed. When asked why, he pointed out that he was in room 137 and believed that meant that he wouldn't leave the hospital. In a scary coincidence, he passed away in room 137 on December 15th. Number 3 On Christmas Day 2017, Randy Bong Reyes was celebrating the holiday with his constituents in Manila, the Philippines. Reyes was a local politician and chairman. He shared gifts and sang karaoke. At one point, he decided to sing the famous Frank Sinatra song, My Way. Reyes joked about how dangerous it was. My Way is supposedly cursed. As he sang, he was attacked by men who fled on motorbikes and lost his life. Randy Reyes is one of around a dozen people who have lost their lives while singing My Way. The supposed curse was first brought to the attention of Western audiences by an article in the New York Times in 2010, but it had been well known in the Philippines for years. Karaoke is a popular pastime in the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries. It's a relatively cheap activity and the perfect way to spend time with friends and have a good time. Of course, not everybody who gets the microphone at karaoke night is going to be a good singer. And karaoke rage isn't an uncommon sight at these bars. But a disturbing number of people have been attacked while singing this one specific song. Whether or not this is a strange and scary coincidence is still debated. The attacks supposedly started in 2002, though the most famous of the early examples came in 2007. Romy Balagula was a 29-year-old man enjoying himself at a karaoke bar in San Mateo on May 29, 2003, 
when he took to the stage to sing the Frank Sinatra classic. Unfortunately for Romy, he wasn't one of the most talented singers, which frustrated Robolito Ortega. Ortega was a 43-year-old security guard who was supposed to be stopping any trouble. He shouted for Romy to stop singing because he was out of key. Romy continued to sing anyway. Ortega then pulled out a weapon and fired at Romy. Romy passed away on the spot and Ortega was soon arrested. By this point, the curse of My Way was already well known in the Philippines. News reports at the time said karaoke bars had already begun removing the song from its lists of choices for patrons. But some still allowed it to be sung and the crimes continued. Most of the crimes associated with the My Way killings took place between 2002 and 2012, but there were still some that met a dark fate shortly after singing or attempting to sing the classic. In the summer of 2014, news stories broke about the passing of a man named Ricamara Policardo. Ricamara was a 44-year-old construction worker who spent an evening drinking in a karaoke bar with a co-worker, Sammy Dakatinen Jr. Dakatinen suggested his friend sing My Way, either not knowing or caring about the supposed curse. Rigamara refused, which angered Dakatinen. The incident didn't happen straight away though. Instead, the two went back to the barracks where they lived. It was then that Dakatinen took a bladed weapon and attacked his friend. Rigamara passed away from his wounds. The curse isn't limited to the Philippines, with many countries in Southeast Asia reporting similar eerie incidents of the curse. In 2012, a fight broke out in a bar in China. A son of a man identified as Mr. Yoon was singing My Way when his uncles started to ridicule Yoon and his wife. At first, the fight was limited to shoves and a few punches before Mr. Yoon's nephew, Mr. Hu, slipped out to the noodle shop where he worked and returned with a kitchen utensil. Mr. Hu attacked the uncles that had been ridiculing Mr. Yoon. Both passed away from their wounds. Not all incidents of the My Way curse cost people their lives, but the reputation has naturally led to many being fearful of singing the song at all. There are a number of theories about why this particular song has caused so many incidents. Some believe that it's just a statistical coincidence. With karaoke so popular in the Philippines and the surrounding country, with alcohol normally present at the locations where it takes place, it's not surprising that many fights have broken out during the activity. Even without alcohol, someone singing off-key can be extremely frustrating to those listening to them. Adding alcohol to the mix would only make people act more recklessly. My Way isn't the only song that led to people losing their lives. People around the world have been violently attacked by audience members for poor singing. On one occasion in 2008, a man in Thailand attacked eight people, including his brother-in-law for singing Country Roads Take Me Home but no other song's victim rate compares to that of My Way. At the moment, the most recent of the My Way curse victims passed away after a fight in 2018. Whether the song is cursed or it's just a creepy coincidence, it's understandable why many karaoke singers, both in the Philippines and abroad, decided against singing My Way, not wanting to tempt the final curtain call. Number 2 On the evening of June 4, 1976, the body of a young woman was discovered in a ditch in the suburb of Erdington, Birmingham. She was later identified as Barbara Forrest, a 20-year-old woman who had gone missing about a week earlier. The discovery would lead to an unsolved mystery and highlighted an eerie coincidence. Barbara was a care worker at a children's home, located just a short distance away from where her body was eventually found. She had grown up in Erdington and was known for her work in the Lutheran Church. Barbara was a national secretary for the Lutheran Church Youth Movement, and she was dating the son of a church minister. On May 26th, Barbara and her boyfriend spent time at the church before heading to a club in the Hansworth area of Birmingham. The two stayed out until around 1 a.m. the following morning, when Barbara's boyfriend walked her to a bus stop. The last time he saw her, she was waiting for the 67 bus at 12.50 a.m. Barbara was reported as a missing person not long after, and police got to work tracing her last known movements. They were certain Barbara had caught the bus, though early news reports described a tall man who was seen hanging out at a bus stop who police wanted to trace. When Barbara's body was found, it was obvious that she had caught the bus. She was found just a few hundred yards away from her home. Her clothing was missing, 
though a blue shoe was located near her body. It had actually been the shoe that caught the attention of a passerby, who would then locate Barbara's body hidden by the brambles. She had bruising around her neck and police were quickly able to determine the cause of her passing. Just 10 days before Barbara had been attacked, she had told a co-worker that she thought the month ahead was going to be a bad month for her. She couldn't explain why and told her co-worker not to ask. It was an eerie prediction that would soon come true. That wasn't the only disturbing coincidence in this case though. In fact, the suburb of Erdington was reminded of a creepy similar case that happened in the very same location where Barbara was found. Barbara was found in a ditch in Pipe Hayes Park. 157 years earlier, the park was still there, though it hadn't been named yet. There were still many ditches and some formed pools of water. On May 27, 1817, a passerby spotted the clothing of a woman near one of these pools. He found a red slick nearby and found two sets of footprints to a pool. The footprints were those of a man and a woman, though only the larger prints walked away from the pool. Beneath the murky water, the body of a 20-year-old woman was uncovered. Her name was Mary Ashford, and it was less than four hours since she had last been seen alive. The day before, Mary had been alive and well. She worked as a housekeeper at her uncle's farm in Sutton Coldfield, on the outskirts of Birmingham, but would regularly travel into the nearby city. On May 26th, she stopped by the home of Hannah Cox, who lived in Erdington, to drop off some clothes. They planned to go to the dance at the Tyburn House Inn. As it was closer to Hannah's home, she left her dance outfit there so she could change after work. The two young women attended the dance as planned and each was approached by a man. In Mary's case, that man was 24-year-old Abraham Thornton. Abraham was described as heavyset and didn't have that good of a reputation. According to some people at the inn, when he spotted Mary, he asked who she was. When he was told, he'd made a remark about Mary's sister and made it his mission to leave the dance with Mary. Abraham would later deny the comments. Mary danced with Abraham for most of the night while Hannah danced with a man named Benjamin Carter. At around 11 p.m., Hannah wanted to leave, but Mary wanted to continue dancing with Abraham. They stayed a little longer until Hannah was finally able to convince her friend to leave at around midnight. Abraham came with them while Benjamin returned to the dance. After walking together for a while, Mary told Hannah she wouldn't go back to Erdington with her and would instead spend the night at her grandfather's as it was closer to work. The two friends went their separate ways with Abraham escorting Mary. At around 4 a.m., Mary returned to Hannah's home. She seemed to be in good spirits and Hannah was enthusiastic to hear about Mary's time with Abraham. Mary didn't say much, but changed into her work clothes and left. It was the last time anybody saw Mary alive. Just four hours later, her body would be pulled from a pool of water. It was discovered that she had drowned, but the police and the local community suspected something sinister had happened. Abraham was identified as the man whom Mary spent most of the evening with. He was apparently shocked when he learned what had happened to her and even more shocked when it became clear that he was the prime suspect. He claimed he and Mary had walked towards her grandfather's home before climbing a fence into one of the fields. There, they lay together and looked up at the stars. At 3.30 a.m., they'd gotten up and walked towards the stile near Hannah's home, where Mary left Abraham. Abraham had waited outside of Hannah's home, but when it became clear Mary wasn't coming straight back out, he had left. He was later seen at about 4.30 a.m., walking towards his home in Castle Bromwich by laborers at a local farm. If the timings were accurate, it would have been impossible for him to have taken Mary's life and get so far away in such a short span of time. However, Abraham was the son of well-to-do parents, and it's possible those laborers worked for his father. There was no evidence in the case, but it still went to court. Abraham was found not guilty, but Mary's brother wouldn't settle for the answer. He used an ancient law to bring a private appeal against Abraham. Abraham was arrested again and this time taken to London to be tried. He pleaded not guilty and used another ancient law to request a trial by battle. Mary's brother wouldn't take up the offer and Abraham walked free. The high-profile case actually led to both the law that allowed a private appeal and the law allowing trial by battle to be changed. The local community was still certain Abraham was behind the crime. 
He eventually moved to America, where he worked as a bricklayer and started his own family. The crime was never solved, if there was a crime at all. It's also possible that Mary had accidentally ended up in the water. It's possible she had been drinking and she was walking through the field at night. It would have been before sunrise. There are many eerie similarities between Mary and Barbara's cases. Not only did they both pass away on the same day, in the same place, and were the same age, but the main suspect in both cases was named Thornton. Unlike in Mary's case, it wasn't Barbara's romantic partner that the police focused on. Instead, Barbara's co-workers highlighted a man named Michael Ian Thornton. Michael was another one of Mary's co-workers who had apparently been acting suspiciously. Investigators found red stains on his pants and his alibi for the night of the crime was proven false. But there was still no solid evidence that he was guilty. Like Abraham Thornton, the case went to trial and Michael was found not guilty. The two cases have other scary coincidences. Both women passed away on the night of a holiday. In Mary's case, it was Whit Monday. In Barbara's, it was the Spring Bank holiday. Her body was discovered the day after Whit Monday. Some sources also claim the two women shared the same birthday. It's unlikely that whoever took Barbara Forrest's life had planned to repeat the crime of 157 years earlier, making it nothing more than a creepy coincidence. Barbara's case is still open. Her family has campaigned for justice, but evidence in the case has unfortunately been lost in the years since she passed away. Number 1 The fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire was a turning point in the history of Europe. For some, it marks the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the modern period. It was also a time of great omens and prophecies that, due to strange coincidences, came true. Constantinople had been the capital of the Roman Empire for more than a thousand years, by 1453. The Western Roman Empire had fallen, but the East had held strong for centuries. Known to most as the Byzantine Empire, it had been a rich empire. But by the 1400s, it was in a steady decline. An empire that had once held most of the Mediterranean was now little more than a city-state. Still, the city of Constantinople stood strong. The only time it had ever been captured had been by the Crusaders during the Fourth Crusade, who had been called to defend Christendom, but instead became tangled up in local politics. The Byzantines had retaken the city a few decades later, but the strength of Rome had long gone. Still, Constantinople had stood against Murad II, who had besieged the city in 1421. In that case, though, it was more ingenuity in politics rather than strength that had saved the city. The Sultan's brother had been sent to rebel against Murad II, drawing attention away and forcing the end of the siege. In 1451, Mehmed II succeeded his father to the throne of the Ottoman Empire. While still extremely young, he was determined to succeed where his father had failed and take Constantinople. There were a number of prophecies about Constantinople. Being such an ancient city, it had gathered a mystic. Like many prophecies, some were so general they could apply to pretty much anything, and often they would be highlighted after battles to show that this was how things had always been meant to be. Some of the prophecies that were later claimed to be about the Ottomans had held up as signs that the Byzantines were always going to beat various armies that had tried to seize the city before. But one prophecy that couldn't be attributed to any other instance was that of the second Constantine. Constantine the Great had founded Constantinople as his capital, wanting to be closer to his main rival, which was Persia at the time. He was the son of a woman named Helena. According to prophecy, Constantinople would also fall while under the control of an emperor named Constantine, whose mother was named Helena. Ten more Constantines would come and go over the following thousand years, but only Constantine XI would be the son of a Helena. He would be the final Byzantine Empire. It was an eerie echo of another scary coincidence. The names of the first and final rulers of Rome were both named Romulus. At first, there wasn't any reason to believe this emperor would be the final emperor. It's unlikely that many knew of the prophecy. It was normally only after they came true that they would be shared among the people. There was one relatively well-known prophecy, though, that stated that Constantinople wouldn't fall until the moon itself gave a sign. The final siege of Constantinople began on April 6th. The Ottoman army greatly outnumbered the defenders, but they had faith in the walls that surrounded the city. 
They had protected them for centuries, and the defenders trusted that they would protect them again. However, the advancements in gunpowder technology meant that the walls could no longer stand against the weapons of the attackers. The walls began to fall. Repairs took place at night, but the Ottomans gradually wore down the energy of the defenders. Even so, Greek ingenuity seemed to be working. When the Ottomans tried to dig tunnels beneath the walls, the Greeks used counterminers to stop them. The Greek fire was spread to the Ottoman tunnels and they were eventually abandoned. By late May, both sides were exhausted. There was no help coming from elsewhere in Europe, and Constantinople couldn't take much more. However, those in the Ottoman army were also considering abandoning the siege. They were better equipped for siege warfare than European armies, but the morale was wearing thin. By coincidence, that was when the moon finally showed its sign. On the night of May 22nd, there should have been a full moon. When the defenders looked up, they saw only a thin crescent moon in the sky. Over the course of the night, it gradually grew to its full state, but it was a dark orange or red color. The moon, not being as expected, would have been terrifying enough to an ordinary soldier. Being the color of blood was equally terrifying. But combined with the fact that the Ottoman army flew flags with crescent moons on them, this definitely seemed like a sign from God. The Ottoman army also took this to be a sign that they would win the battle. In reality, the crescent moon was nothing more than a coincidence. This was a partial lunar eclipse, caused by the Earth passing directly between the moon and the sun, and casting its shadow on the lunar surface. This particular lunar eclipse was also seen across Africa, Oceania, Asia, the Middle East, and parts of Europe. This wasn't the only bad omen or coincidence that took place that May, though. The defenders took to other traditions. It was long believed that the Virgin Mary was a protector of the city. There was a painting of Mary with baby Jesus, which was said to have been painted by St. Luke. During past sieges, it had been moved around the city and was believed to help the victory. Now the citizens of Constantinople turned to it again. A great procession began through the city, but it was almost washed away by a heavy thunderstorm that flooded the streets. The symbol of Mary fell to the ground, which was also seen as a bad omen. Then another few days passed and a thick fog enveloped the city. It was extremely strange weather, and people at the time took it to be another sign that this was the end. In Constantinople, Christians took it to mean that God was leaving the city. To the Ottomans, it meant victory. The final of these strange omens was a fire that seemed to burn the Hagia Sophia. At first, it was believed to have been set by the Ottomans in some way. Even though they hadn't breached the walls yet, it was later discovered to only be light. Again, this was seen as God or the Holy Spirit leaving the city. In reality, all this strange weather may have been the result of a volcanic eruption. At some time between 1952 and 1953, there was at least one eruption that impacted weather around the globe. Scientists are still uncertain where exactly this eruption took place, but both sides of the equator were impacted. Centuries later, after the eruption of Krakatoa, the afterglows that were seen as far away as New York were mistaken for fires. It's possible that similar afterglows were what the defenders saw. These signs may have been a morale boost for the Ottomans, but Mehmed was unlikely to have backed down, even if the coincidence hadn't taken place. On May 29th, the final push came to an end, and the Ottomans entered the city. The siege was over, and Constantinople would be the new capital of the Ottoman Empire. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.